Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum and good afternoon from Glasgow, Scotland's largest city. I am Shahid Anif, the uh, Chief Operating Officer here um, from uh, Colourful Heritage. It gives me uh, great pleasure to kick off the, the first panel of the uh, MacFest 2022 Festival. This is the first time uh, Colourful Heritage have been asked to participate in this uh, fantastic event and uh, it truly looks like a packed itinerary uh, stretching over several weeks and it generally looks like a global festival celebrating Muslim culture and Muslim uh, art and identity. Colourful Heritage are based in Scotland in Glasgow uh, in uh, the UK's third largest city and uh, we have uh, we basically our, our, our ethos is centered around three words capture celebrate and inspire. By capture, we mean we, uh, we're creating the largest archive of uh, oral histories of South Asian immigrants uh, and Muslims uh, to Scotland. Uh, we celebrate the contribution and sacrifices uh, of these early pioneers. And we hope to finally inspire future generations to build a more caring and cohesive society. So a little bit about uh, Colourful Heritage, uh, a bit about our background. We have we set out 10 years ago, uh, just over 10, year, 10 years ago, to amass the oral narratives, uh, the stories of early uh, Muslim and South Asian immigrants uh, to Scotland. And to this end, we created a digital timeline of events stretching over several decades up to the present. And in doing so, we have created over a hundred uh, oral videos. Uh, we have working closely with our stakeholder, the Glasgow Museums. We created a public exhibition with our stakeholder. And we have also created educational resource packs, which we deliver uh, digitally uh, to primary schools and um, exploring the, uh, uh, the uh, and documenting the um, the, uh, the contribution of these early migrants. Uh, initially, when they came over in the 40s and 50s, they were applying their trade as peddlers, uh, for example, door-to-door -door salesmen. And um, we've also basically uh, uh, put together their contribution to the civic life, the political life, the business life, not only by the Muslims, but also by the Hindus and the Sikhs. And we've also basically uh, collated the historical accounts of the British Indian Army, which was made up of Muslims, Sikhs, and Hindus in the True Gate Wars. So this is what we've uh, done over the last 10 years. And um, we've now basically reached a situation where we are uh, actively involved within the community. Our chief guest speaker today, uh, kicking off the panel, uh, is Duncan Dornan. 
Uh, Duncan was appointed head of museums and collections for Glasgow Life in 2015, having joined the company in 2013 as a senior museums manager. Uh, prior to this, he had worked uh, with the National Museums of Scotland um, since 1999 as a museum manager. Uh, within Glasgow Life, his role evolves around the responsibility for the management and development of Glasgow's eight world-class museums, along with the innovative Glasgow Museums Resources Centre. He's also responsible for the city's collections covering archaeology, natural history, technology, fine and decorative arts, social history, and the special collections in the Mitchell Library and the City Archives. I'll now pass over the panel to Duncan Dorman. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to speak to you this afternoon and, 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 and delighted to have been asked um, and to talk a little about uh, our relationship with colourful history and the, and the outputs we've achieved over the, the duration of that relationship. Um, a key date for us is, is 2014. At that time, uh, Colourful Heritage had successfully established the Bashir Mine Archive uh, and we're looking for a permanent home to locate the archive and secure it for the future. Uh, Despite uh, some fairly stiff competition from the National Museums in Edinburgh, we were fortunately able to secure it uh, and locate it in the Glasgow City Archive in the Mitchell Library. Um, we were delighted to be able to do this because the, the archive uh, provides uh, the history of Glasgow, a very comprehensive history of Glasgow uh, from the Middle Ages through to the present day. It's one of the largest city archives in, in the UK. And the uh, South Asian community in Glasgow are, are, are both a, a large, uh, successful and influential part of our, our community and it, we felt very important uh, that this story was represented in the archive and continues to evolve within our archive. Uh, so those conversations were successful and we were able to secure the archive which continues to develop in the Mitchell to this day. However, in discussion with Colourful Heritage, uh, we were able to establish both that Colourful Heritage aspired to, 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 to much more than the archive uh, and at the same time Glasgow Museums were, were particularly conscious of the fact that the demographics of our audience did not match those of the city and that in particular the South Asian community was under underrepresented in, in the people visiting our museum. Uh, Colourful Heritage undertook a, a review of, of the offer in our museums to, to try to identify some of the issues within the, the museum institutions and uh, one of the outputs from this was that we identified we needed to create more content within museums which reflected the experience of, of the, the South Asian diaspora and particularly told the, the, the story of this first generation arriving in Glasgow which was uh, the, the subject obviously of the Bashir Mine Archive. So this led to the creation of the Glaswegian Asians exhibition in Scotland School. Uh, this was a co-curated exhibition uh, we held sessions to uh, explore the stories which the, the community wanted to see displayed. Uh, we developed the content with uh, members of the community and many of the objects on display in the exhibitions were loaned from individuals in the community. And this was a, an exciting opportunity to allow this, this, uh, the, the, these interesting uh, and revealing stories to be told in, in the words of the people who'd actually experienced this. Uh, one of the other key issues that came out through the Glaswegian Asians exhibition was the, the under-representation of the role that, that uh, people from India and Pakistan had played in both world wars. Uh, and uh, we were delighted when, uh, as a consequence of this exhibition and work, other work done by Colourful Heritage, a wreath was finally laid to the British Indian Army at the Cenotaph in Glasgow, marking that, that massive contribution. Um, the Glaswegian Asian exhibition attracted uh, significant critical praise, uh, a great deal of, of interest, uh, and we had many high profile visits to, to Scotland Street during the, the run of the exhibition, uh, and was helpful in significantly changing our audience. So we really started to redress that imbalance we had in, in the attendance in museums, uh, and to raise the profile of, of, of the community within, within Glasgow. Um, the exhibition had proved very successful in Scotland Street. We're now uh, working on a revised version of it, which will be on display in one of our uh, other museums. We're, we're developing that for the People's Palace. Uh, and this is a stepping stone onto more widespread representation of the community across all of our museums. Uh, but we feel in the museum service a very successful stepping stone. Uh, and we're very grateful to the, the hard work um, uh, and the creativity of Colourful Heritage uh, in developing this and, and making it such a success. Um, Glaswegian Asians uh, was a, a mainstream provision in our, one of our museums, but we then moved on from this to develop more bespoke material uh, aimed at the school's uh, contingency. 
Glasgow Museums is a very successful schools program. Around 97% of children in Glasgow attend uh, a program offered by Glasgow Museums. So we're very pleased to be able to work with Colourful Heritage, who, who proved to be a, an excellent and, and very creative partner, to develop five primary school resource packs. Uh, these packs cover the, the role of the British Indian Army in World War I, uh, the Army in World War II, uh, along with information on Force K6, uh, which was a significant presence in Scotland during World War II, uh, a pack on uh, South Asian entrepreneurs in, Glas in Scotland, uh, a pack on political and civic contributions, and a pack on um, migration and cultural identity. These packs are extremely viable, both in, in, in raising awareness of the, the South Asian community, uh, creating um, a, a greater sense of uh, connection, uh, particularly for people outside the community, into the community, and also in um, influencing our school children to see Glasgow as the, as the successful uh, and uh, diverse city, which it is. Um, so the relationship with, with Colourful Heritage has, has worked extremely well for us as an organisation. Um, their influence has been very positive uh, and we believe there's, there's still a very strong future for us in, in expanding this work and really changing how we collect, how we display uh, and really, really building relationships for the museum service uh, into all areas of the community. Um, I'm very happy now to pass on to the next speaker. Thank you very much indeed. I mean, thank you very much, uh, Duncan, for those informative few minutes uh, highlighting the special relationship uh, and indeed the considerable outputs that Glasgow Museums and uh, Club of Heritage have managed to professionally execute over the past uh, several years. Okay, now it's for uh, the next uh, 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 colleague of mine on the panel um, is uh, Dr. Saka Bazak, uh, armed with a doctoral degree in uh, chemistry, organic chemistry from uh, St. Andrews University. Um, Saqib uh, was appointed as chief researcher at Colourful Heritage using her research and analytical skills to trace the roots of early South Asian settlers to Scotland. Uh, she has uh, conducted oral videos uh, of uh, South Asian immigrants and some of her elders uh, in creating the digital archive, uh, has helped write a, helped write a chapter called Feeling Scottish Being Muslim in a book titled Scotland's Mus Muslims, Society, Politics and Identity, helped set up the first of its kind historical South Asian exhibition, uh, as Duncan pointed out, the Glaswegians uh, exhibition at Scotland Street Museum, and uh, was uh, instrumental in developing the educational resource packs, which again Duncan highlighted there, uh, working in conjunction very closely with the Glasgow Museums. So I would now like to hand over to my colleague uh, Sakib for her presentation. Our presentation will take two parts. The first part will look at um, the contribution of Scotland's Muslims. And in the second part of the presentation, the, uh, the immense contribution of the British Indian Army uh, in the two great wars, uh, the uh, First World War and the Second World War. So I now hand over to uh, Sakib Azak. Assalamualaikum. Good morning, good evening. Good afternoon, no matter where you are in the world. I, 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 I'm sure there's many people from all over that are joining in for today's uh, talk. I just want to thank uh, Brother Shahid and also Duncan Dornan from Glasgow Museums for their uh, introduction and for their talks, just kind of highlighting, giving you a flavour of uh, what Colourful Heritage is about uh, just before I start my talk. I'd also like to thank Gestra as well for her um, invitation and also you know, the opening ceremony this morning was fantastic. There was lots of events, really an eye opener and you know, hats off to her for pulling off what will be um, quite a colourful year, I think, you know, with nearly 75 events. So if you can just bear with me while I share my screen and pull up my slides from my talk. Okay, I think everybody can see that. So as Brother Shahid said, my talk today is about the contribution of Scotland's Muslims and the story of Force K6, and it will be in two parts. There'll be a question and answer session, uh, which you can add in your questions into the chat box after part one. So this will be about a half an hour talk and lots of slides. And then we'll move on to part two, which will be about the British Indian, the British Indo-Pak Army, sorry, 
and the connection of Force K6 with Scotland. So please type in any questions you have that come to your mind during the talk, just type them into the, the chat box, which I have for later. Okay, I guess the reason for this presentation is to celebrate and to inspire others, you know, to let other people know of the amazing achievements that the South Asian community have made within Scotland, uh, particularly our South Asian and Muslim elders. Now, as you know, uh, many of you may, may know or may not know, in fact, that colourful heritage document the stories of not just the Muslims in Scotland, but in fact, the South Asian community as a whole. So we capture stories of the Sikh community, the Hindu community, and, also, and you know, of course, the, the Christian South Asian community as well, as well as the Pakistani and non-Pakistani Muslims. So and I guess this is just to highlight the very unique story that Scotland itself has, and it's very unique heritage story. And I hope you're able to learn and pass on some of this information to youngsters or to other people in other organizations um, you know, we want people to know this story so that, you know, they, they feel proud of their heritage and identity. So before I go on, I want to just highlight a couple of resources that Colourful Heritage have created. Uh, you saw from that promo video, we and also Shahid mentioned as well, we've got up to date now over 120 very unique and amazing oral video histories of people from our community. And this is just a selection of a few. And you can see it's from both men and women from a variety of faiths that have come on and given their first-hand accounts and talked about um, you know, stories such as partition, India-Pakistan partition. They've talked about their own personal migration to Scotland. How did they find work here? How did they find um, you know, coping with family life? And then eventually settling in Scotland today. And many of these stories are in English. Of course, there are a few that are also in Urdu and Punjabi that have been translated on YouTube. So this should make it accessible for everyone to, to follow and to watch. And there's a website there, colorfulheritage.com, and you can go to the video section. Okay, so that was one of the resources. Uh, this is a book that Shahid had mentioned. It's a book that we published a chapter in called, it's a book's called Scotland's Muslims, Society, Politics and Identity by Edinburgh University. And the chapter's called Feeling Scottish and Being Muslim. And this actually is a chapter which is based upon identity of the Scottish Muslim diaspora and how from our interviews we gathered, you know, uh, data to, to relate as to what the Scottish identity um, is, you know, what, what identity the, the Scottish Muslims feel presently. You know, many of them gave um, amazing answers, you know, such as being Scottish Muslims, Scottish Pakistani Muslims, so they, they weren't able to give just the one kind of identity answer, but also there's a, a little bit of background as to why this sentiment is so strongly felt within the, the Muslim community. So if you get a chance, you know, do have a look at this chapter within this book. It, the, 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 the book itself actually charts the lives and times of Scotland's Muslims living in contemporary Scotland. So do take a look. Okay, one of our other recent uh, resources that we've made uh, last year was called Explore Heritage. And this consists of Explore Scotland, which um, is a, a, an interactive map that you can actually see on your screen and click on a different area and it should be able to take you to some information about heritage, South Asian or Muslim heritage within that area. So for example, you can see there is something in um, Orkney, you can see something in Glencarran Estate, there is also something in Laird. So there's you know, all sorts of uh, places in Scotland. And of course, you know, if anybody has any other items, then do write into us and let us know. And this is on our website as well. We've also got Explore Glasgow, which is a uh, different areas. It's split into museums, faith buildings, football, and um, restaurants. So anywhere where there's kind of South Asian heritage, you should be able to click on these and see what, what, what the heritage is as well. Okay, so when did it all start? So South Asians have been connected with Scotland for a very long time. And I put down here, even before 1855, which was actually news to me when I first started on this project about four or five years ago, because I, you know, I always thought people came here 
around about 1960s and, you know, 1950s, 60s, and that was it. But, you know, I was really surprised to know this. And I guess they've got a very long connection in terms of, you know, they were Indian servants. So India being part of Pakistan, India, Pakistan at the time together, there were Indian servants. They were also the Lashkar, the seamen that came employed on British ships as sort of cheap labor at the time. There were also ayahs and ummas that acted as nannies for the children of Scottish families. And this was even before 1855. However, in 1855, we have the first confirmed person uh, known as Maharaja Dilip Singh. So, like I said, my, my talk will be, it will cover mostly Muslims, but there will be, I'll pepper in a couple of other um, people from other faiths as well. So what we've done is we've created a digital timeline on our website. This is our one of our other resources as well. And you can see in 1855, we have Maharaja Dilip Singh from Lahore, who was um, deposed to the Grand Tully estate in Perthshire. So he actually came and stayed in Scotland. And there's his, his heritage is also um, in Menzi, Castle Menzies in Stirling as well. I believe one of his first children uh, is buried within uh, one of the churches near Stirling as well. So there's quite a lot of heritage. We've also got, you know, the Lashkars coming in about 1860. The timeline will show you that there's uh, peddlers that have started to come round about the late 1800s, early 1900s. This is an extract from a registrar, registrar, a register from Mitchell Library, which has got names of some of these peddlers when they registered for their licenses. And then, of course, we've also got, you know, the story of um, Lady Zainab Kobold, who was the first British Muslim who travelled to Mecca for Hajj in 1933. So she converted to Islam and her estate is in Glencarran estate within the Highlands. Now we've also got, you know, clips, little nuggets of information about, for example, the first um, Celtic football player called Muhammad Salim, also known as Twinkle Toes, who arrived in, in Glasgow and played for Celtic in 1936. So the timeline goes all the way up to 2021. So there's the address there, do check it out for sort of little nuggets of information. Okay. So I wanted to talk to you now a little bit about some of the pioneering peddlers, Punjabi peddlers in Scotland. And of course, for those of you that don't know what a peddler is, that is somebody who is a door-to-door -door salesman. So usually they take a large suitcase and they go around door to door selling household items. And this is probably one of the first jobs that the South Asian community did when they first arrived in Scotland. Many of them came from the Punjab region to, to Glasgow. And these Punjabi peddlers created their own jobs. So they weren't competing for jobs with other people. They made their own kind of work. So they weren't working in factories. It was, you know, self-employment. And many of them went on to become, you know, um, entrepreneurs and open up big, bigger businesses and other, other types of businesses, franchise into different types of businesses. So the information in my presentation is an amalgamation from Uncle Bashir Mann, who you can see on the right here, his, his books, he's got three books out. And also from the interviews of people that I personally interviewed myself and within the Colourful Heritage Archive. In fact, there are just too many people to mention. So I've just taken a select few for today just to highlight their story. And I'll try and highlight if their children have given any interviews on the way as well along, as we go along. So one of the first people that, that I know of that has come to Glasgow, that's come to my attention, is this gentleman here called uh, Noor Muhammad Dunda, who arrived in Glasgow in 1916. And that's the only picture that I have of him. He opened a, a warehouse with uh, Mr. Atta Ashraf, who arrived in 1926. And both of them together had this warehouse in the Gorbals, which I'll go on to talk about next. But just to give you a quick flavor, we've also got uh, Mr. Yaqub Ali, who was the owner of Castle Cash and Carry, one of the largest castle, uh, cash and carries in Europe. He arrived in 1952 and was the best friend of uh, Uncle Bashir Man, who arrived a year later. And I'll talk about both of these men a little bit later on in my talk. So this picture here you see is from outside Dundar National Warehouse in the Gorbos, 1953. And you can see that there's a group of peddlers. So there's a group of these men 
very nicely, very smartly dressed um, in sort of British clothing, standing outside look, waiting to see somebody off who's going by road to India or to Pakistan. And we've got an interview of Mr. Atta Ashraf's grandson, Zahid Ashraf, in our archive, if you want to hear it. He goes into more detail about this, you know, um, about this warehouse. Essentially, the warehouse itself was a hub for um, all the peddlers to gather. And it was somewhere where they all gathered together at four o'clock and, you know, they would have their tea, they would socialise, they would play cards. And Mr. Ashraf's wife and family lived upstairs from this warehouse. So upstairs there was a tenement. And so his wife was sent down tea at four o'clock. So this was like a main hub, um, a meeting point. And this is where they would share their sort of day-to-day peddling experiences, you know, how did it go, what sold, what didn't, what area was good, you know, anything they learned, any tips, and also get advice on housing matters as well. And very often Mr. Ashraf and Mr. Dunder would give the peddlers items or um, in good faith and, and sort of goodwill. And we would not take payment for them at the time until they'd actually sold them and got the money. So essentially this place was acting as a mini bank for this early startup of the community. And obviously as a, as a hub as well, because at that point there was no mosque. Um, earlier on when this had started, there was a mosque, but it was just beginning to, um, they, they just started to, to, to make, to, to have the mosque converted and there was building works going on inside it. So this was a main point for them. It's really interesting to see that these people are wearing very outwardly clothes, very smartly dressed with the trench coats and their hats. So they were very much integrated, you can see in this picture, very much trying to integrate and to try and fit in. So they adopted the way of um, Britain by wearing these kind of outwardly, um, outwardly dressed in these kind of clothes. So a couple of other people I wanted to mention was Haji Shir Muhammad, who arrived in 1936. And he's the owner of the, the Shear Brothers Empire in Glasgow. And even today, they, they still have um, the House of Shear um, Plaza, I would call it, you know, with lots of shops inside it. So it's still very much in the running in Glasgow, part of Glasgow's fabric. And we've got uh, somebody called Mr. Nehar Singh Rakra, who arrived in 1947. I've got his interview recorded in the archive. And he actually is one of the oldest entrepreneurs. He's about 95. And up to two years ago, he was still going into his office. So that was a really interesting story from him to find out about Glasgow. And of course, we've also got Mohammed Pufail, Sh Pufail Shaheen, who is the owner of Shaheen Kashinkari, and he's also the founder of Glasgow, the Caring City. And he also helped out quite a lot with the future planning and building of Glasgow Central Mall. So these are quite important people within um, the foundation of Glasgow. And just to show you, these are some of their shops. So this is the Shear Brothers shop in 1973 in Gorbals. A lot of this has all been knocked down now because of new development there with the Sheriff Court. And we've also got Shaheen Cash and Carry there at the corner as well in Norfolk Street. So these are the early starts of their businesses. So they've gone on from warehouses to smaller shops. So the next person I wanted to highlight was a Mr. Nawab Dean who arrived in Glasgow in 1954. And again, you know, arrived with hardly any money, but had a vision, had a, had a passion to do something. And he married somebody called Darcy Dean, and both of them, sorry, Darcy, and both of them, Mr. and Mrs. Dean together, built their, um, the, the Dean Cash, the D&D &D Cash and Carry brand. So originally it was based within the Gorbals, within a converted building, but he had a vision and eventually went on to build Glasgow's first purpose-built cash and carry. Now he arrived himself from Chichavatni, just uh, in the district of Sahiwal, and he wasn't able to speak much English at all, but yet because he was so passionate, he decided, and he was very good in business terms, that he was able to then you know, start up his business. And he was also a peddler. And when he built this, this particular cash and carry, which still stands in Glasgow, known as ABS Cash and Carry now. He wanted to improve the customer experience and he also wanted to introduce proper parking, proper till points, because many of these buildings were in small, tight, um, unsafe, um, many of these businesses were in very small, unsafe, uh, tight buildings. So this was the first time that somebody had built this in 1982. 
but it also provided a lot of storage space for goods. And it was quite a big deal at the time. You know, a lot of people um, uh, visited this and it was a different customer experience. So a year later, Mr. Yakub Ali, who I've already mentioned before, who'd also arrived with very few money, uh, very few money in his pocket, built Castle Cash and Carry. I don't have a picture of that. So if anybody does have one, do send it in to me. He went on to build the Europe's largest castle cash and carry in the Gorbals. And eventually he was also involved a lot in the mosque committee in planning for the central mosque. He donated a very large sum of nearly half a million pounds to Strathclyde University and eventually went on to receive an OBE for his services. So this is all for humble beginnings of being um, a peddler. So this is quite an interesting picture I thought I'd put in. It's a picture in Glasgow Museum's collections. It has, it shows a really brightly colored uh, shop front, which we believe it may be either in, in Gorbals or near sort of the Cathcart Road end of Glasgow. And it's called Nemeth Gada, which means the blessed one. So having worked as peddlers or even in fact in the buses, which we'll talk about later as well, many of the South Asian community picked up language skills. So they were able to then, you know, open up their own businesses. And you can see this is amazing that it's got writing in English, but also very much in Urdu language. I mean, this is probably one of the first mutai shops, sweet meat shop, like a carrier restaurant type of um, shop at the time, very brightly colored. So if anybody has any information on that as well, do get in touch and let me know. But I thought that was a nice one to just add in. So many of the ladies also went on to become entrepreneurs as well. And they would start off their businesses at home, sewing clothes eventually, you know, contributing to the family expenses, um, earning money. They would have loose cloth at home in certain, some rooms, so they'd be selling the, the, the loose material. But many of them went on and uh, opened up, you know, sort of smaller businesses. And this is one example of somebody from Edinburgh, and this is Shaheen Yunus. CBE. She worked in a restaurant and got experience um, and she arrived a little bit later on in 1967. But having built up that experience, she went on to open her first restaurant in Edinburgh. I believe it was called Nadia's. And then by 1998, she's got Mrs. Junis Spice Foods Limited uh, all started up and she had a vision of helping other Asian women that were at home to try and get them out into the factory to try and help her. And by 2016, a lot of her products, you know, you probably know her from the products in Asda. She sells the, um, she's got pakoras, Mrs. Eunice Nans, all sorts of brands of food. So that's one of the, the bigger entrepreneurs in Glasgow. Uh, sorry, in Edinburgh. And of course, one of the UK's most popular dishes, in fact, was invented at Shish Mahal restaurant in the West End. The dish itself was cre created by Mr. Ali Ahmed. That's in there on the left, standing outside in 1970s. And you can see there's a big queue of people queuing to get into this restaurant. And that's what the dish looks like. And so, so it goes that he made, he made a dish, sent it out to a customer, it was too dry. And he came back and he added some gravy to it uh, from apparently from a, a, a tin of condensed soup, tomato soup. So that's what the story goes like. So that's some of the inventions. Now, if I move on to the fact that Glasgow Transport Corporation heavily relied on South Asian, the South Asian uh, community during, especially the 1960s and the 1970s. And they played a vital role in keeping the transport system going at that point. And the reason they, they worked here was because, you know, it, they, they learned so many skills, they learned driving skills, they were made aware of different areas within, within Glasgow, within Edinburgh, within Dundee, and they were able to get overtime. So they worked very, very long hours. Now this picture, in fact, is uh, an image of my grandfather from, from Feslabad, and that's the back of the image there as well, in which, you know, um, his son has written that he refused himself all the comforts and always in these black clothes because they worked their normal shift hours, then they worked overtime. So they worked many hours in a day working hard. And very often they came here without the families, maybe one, one or two children and that's it. But the families would be back home in India or Pakistan. 
So they supported not just themselves, but their families as well. Um, and this gave them, a, like I said, gave them a lot of skills. And many of them started off as bus conductors, as drivers. And then, of course, some of them, very few of them went on to being bus inspectors. So we actually have a video of this gentleman here, Muhammad Udin. We have his video telling his story. And in fact, his story is also uh, within the Riverside Museum in one of the films there as well. We managed to get his outfit as a bus as a bus inspector. And this was on display at the Glaswegian Asians exhibition along with a couple of other items as well. You can see there's a suitcase for peddlers as well. He himself was a bank manager in Pakistan, but fell in love with Scotland when he came to visit and decided to stay here. And to this day, he still stays within the Pollock Shields area and really enjoyed working on the buses and making you know, his way up and opening up his other businesses later on. So a couple of other little stories. This is of Dr. Ibrahim Ashraf, who was the um, pretty much, I would say, the first South Asian person in Scotland to be awarded an MBE medal and possibly even in the whole of UK. He's the son of Mr. Atta Ashraf, who had the warehouse. Now, he came here as a child. He's probably one of the first children that came to Glasgow at the age of about, I would say, 10, 11, and enrolled in Allen Glen School, just used to be near Strathclyde University. And he then went back to Pakistan, was there at um, Agricultural University, uh, and then after partition decided to come back to Britain. And in 1948, he enrolled for a PhD in Edinburgh University. And by the time he gets to 1955, he's joined the Foreign Service, a research facility, researching um, various oils, various nut-based oils, and written lots of papers. And by 1963, he was the first person to be awarded an MBE, and he got this for writing a dictionary in the Mandingo language. So he joined the Foreign Service and went to Gambia Research Facility, and so he ended up picking up the language there so well that to help his other colleagues that were coming out to this facility, he was um, rewarded by uh, you know, getting this MBE medal. So the next part of my talk is about the political firsts that have come from UK and from Glasgow. And these are two pictures. The one on the left is Uncle Bashir Man again. He's been lifted up by his colleagues on the shoulders. He was UK's first Justice of Peace in 1968, and then went on to become the first Muslim counselor in 1970. Now prior to him, the only other uh, person of South Asian heritage that was a councillor was Dr. Janthi Das Sagar in 1936, and that was in Dundee. So, he, but he was a first Muslim councillor. Now he was, he came in 1953 to Glasgow and he was university educated, but actually worked as a peddler. So sold items door to door, but he realized that he was heavily involved in helping the community because he was educated. So writing letters, making, you know, if he had to go and see somebody or explain so somebody, explain something to someone, he was able to speak the language. And he made history by becoming the first Muslim counsellor in the ward, um, the Kingston ward, because that was a predominantly Scottish ward. So most of the votes came from the Scottish white people. So he was heavily also involved in setting up Glasgow Central Mosque, along with many countless others, including Yaqub Ali and Uncle Shaheen, as I mentioned before. And during his time in, in, in Glasgow, every year he was involved in some kind of um, voluntary role, of, you know, position of responsibility. He was deputy chairman of the Commission for Racial Equality, deputy lieutenant of Glasgow, convener of Strathclyde Police Board, you know, president of Scottish Council of Voluntary Organisations, countless, countless others. And he was a strong advocate for Muslims to get engaged with playing their part in all aspects of civic life. And he's written three books, which um, kind of document the history of the South Asian community within Scotland. So 37 years later, we then have the first Muslim member of parliament, Mohammed Sarwa in 1997, he gets elected. And he was the first Muslim to take oath on the Quran and before becoming an MP. 
And in fact, the Quran that he took the oath on was in our exhibition as well, which was a very old, 250 years old, one of the oldest Qurans in Scotland. And you'll recognize him as the present day governor of Punjab in Lahore. And what's really interesting actually with both of these men and these achievements is that there's a very small population of South Asians in Glasgow. So we make a thinking of something like less than 2% of the total South Asian population in, in UK. Um, but yet these political firsts are coming from Glasgow rather than, you know, you'd expect them from maybe London or from Birmingham or Manchester, other places where it's, you know, heavily South Asian um, populated. So this demonstrates that there is a very different and unique integration experience within Scotland itself. And of course, the pioneering, and of course, that, that, that can be through various things, such as the kind of work that the community was involved in, the, the, the kindness of the host community, you know, and the, the experience that they've had in Scotland itself. So it meant that they picked up language skills and social skills a lot quicker in Scotland compared with down south in, in England. So these pioneering achievements for both of these individuals has actually opened up the doors to many others in Scotland and of course in the rest of UK. And of course, I wanted to show you this picture of the ladies uh, called Swaranji, also known as Sharon Burmi nowadays. She's one of the first South Asian uh, police officers in Scotland. In 1974, she became a very young cadet. And we have her interview recorded as well. But what's really interesting here is that this is in 1974. And the first Scottish South Asian police woman down south was, I think, 1971. So it shows that we were never that far behind. We were either ahead of the game or we were just there at the same time. So it's quite a forward thinking community within Scotland. And of course, I have her interview recorded as well in our archive. And then we have some of the females, female participation in politics. And we've got Mrs. Saro Jalal, who was the first female South Asian Justice of Peace from Edinburgh, and that was in 1986. And of course, Auntie Praganda from Glasgow, who became the first Muslim Justice of Peace in the early 1990s. And Mr. Shaheen Bufel's daughter, Baroness Nushina Mubarak becomes a member of the House of Lords in 2014. So just coming back to now, Mr. Atta Ashraf, wanted to highlight the story of Glasgow's mosques. So most South Asians came with a five-year plan. They wanted to work, save, and then eventually go back to India or to Pakistan. And yet we have people starting the first mosque. Now, Mr. Ashraf came in 1926 but he set up the constitution and he set up a committee of people in 1933. And this was called Jumiyat al-Muslimin. And by the time we get to 1944, he's been raising funds along with at least another seven people who contributed a hundred pound for this mosque here. Just on the right hand side, you can see this Scotland's first mosque opens in a tenement in the Gorbals. So it's in 27 Oxford Street. And this picture itself is from a video, from video film footage from the National Library of Scotland. Anybody that wants to see that, just go to the National Library of Scotland webpage and Google up um, the word mosque and it should come up with this, the video for this. So this mosque itself, you can see at the bottom, it, this looks like flats, but this was the Indian Seaman's house. Uh, not a house, sorry, it was a club for the Indian seamen, so the people that were travelling on boats coming and going to the docks in Glasgow. First floor there was a mosque and on the second and third floor there was residential houses that were also um, given out on rent. So that was a means of an income for the mosque as well. So this mosque was then knocked down as Gorbals became redeveloped and we then had a second converted mosque in Carlton Place that was donated by Muhammad Tafil Shaheen. And that mosque was eventually, you know, do donated. Uh, the, the sale of that mosque was donated, the money was donated towards Glasgow Central Mosque. But I just wanted to show you this little picture here of some of the things that were going on inside the mosque. There was the Quranic classes that were taking place. And it also was an Urdu school. So in 1961, 
you can see a lot of these children and the teachers in the mosque. And many of these are obviously much older now. Some of these children here on the right hand side are grandchildren of Mr. Muhammad Ashraf. And they've given interviews uh, for our archive as well. So you can see that we had the first Islamic classes and Urdu school in the Oxford Street Mosque. And there's also a black and white film again available at the National Library of Scotland that you can just, uh, if you go to the Moving Image Archive website and just type in mosque, it should be able to come up with the film as well. And you can see these children actually sitting there learning and writing in Urdu as well. So these are just some of the very few people. Um, there's quite a few people that helped out with you know, fundraising for the mosque. Some of the younger members decided that the committee, the committee itself decided that the Muslim community was beginning to settle here and it was growing. So they needed to be something put in place for future foolproofing. So they put up quite a, a, you know, quite a fierce argument with the older members of the community and saying they wanted to raise funds now to build a purpose-built mosque, not just a repurposed building. So plans were finally drawn up and sent to the council. There's a lot of toing and froing backwards. So this process took nearly 20, 25 years. But these are some of the men that you can see. You can see here, there's Rafiq Sher on the left. There's Uncle Tafil Shaheem, Uncle Bashir Man. And they're, they've gone to Pakistan, they went to Saudi Arabia, they spoke to lots of people, they managed to get a lot of funding as well. And you can see uh, President Zial Haq from Pakistan, who in fact eventually donated uh, the, all the carpets in the central mosque, the, all the green carpets, I should say, they've recently been changed in the last two or three years. So he donated the original carpets. And of course, I can't. Finish, I can't do the, finish this talk until I talk about Mr. Fadeh Sharp, who is somebody that was mentioned in many of the interviews that I've done. He was a member of the Glasgow community that arrived in 1930, related to the Ashra family, and he arrived from a village called Mardarpur in India. And so many people have talked to me about him, saying that he, he would lend them money to be able to go back to Pakistan or India. He would... Um, also help, you know, with his own hands, help to repair things in people's houses or take people to hospital for appointments. And, in, and also acted as a translator for the community in those days. And of course, when somebody passed away, he was the first point of call that people would get in touch with. So he was given the unique honor of digging the foundations for Glasgow Central Mosque. And there's a picture there um, from the sort of late, I would say early in the mid 1970s of him um, laying the first foundation brick. And of course, we now have the Glasgow Central Mosque itself, and that's what it looks like. So from the humble beginnings of being in a tenement in 1944, and then 40 years later, we have our own purpose-built mosque. So this is probably the largest project undertaken by both the Muslim men and women. The women did a lot of fundraising, lots of bake sales, lots of Mina bazaars, lots of door to door collecting. And I guess it really shows the sort of forward planning of our elders and really sent a, a clear message to everyone that it kind of signifies that the sort of Muslim community displaying their Muslim identity and the fact it symbolizes that Scotland is our home and that we're here and our, our children are here and they're staying here. So I think this was quite a poignant time for the Muslim community um, in the early 80s. So in conclusion, I'd just like to finish off this part of the talk by saying that these men and women are just some of the early pioneers. There are countless others, so many others, mainly came from the Punjab region and of course spoke very little English, but yet managed to um, do very well. And from the small community, there's been so many different firsts in business and politics. And it kind of shows that there's a, the integration experience is markedly positive compared with experience in England. And of course, each and every one worked very hard to contribute to Glasgow and Scotland. I'd just like to thank everyone for their attention. If you've got any questions, do put them in the chat.